Great. Well, just make a start. <clears throat> um, if, if, if it's OK, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the slides in this terrible format. And, and, and the reason for that is I'm on my I'm on my government laptop and I, and I don't know what it's like in your countries, but um, on my government laptop, I can only do certain things. And one of those things at the moment is that um, I can't access Teams unless it's through the browser part. So if I go into slide share mode and I can see my, see my slides and it probably looks a bit better for you, but I, but I can't see any of your faces. And I and I kind of like to have that interaction, like when I'm when I'm presenting around 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 around, around, around things, because it just gives a you know a, a little a little bit of feedback, you know, some, sometimes. And I could and I could also see if you're checking your emails or not when I'm uh, when I'm talking about things. I'm I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, so what what I thought we would do, if it's okay, is um, I just I've got a bit a bit of a presentation to to, to go through, um, and then really just sort of open it up for a bit of dialogue um, and a bit of conversation. And, and hopefully a bit of advice, um, if, if, that, if that's okay, because it is meant to be, uh, you know, a, a discussion. And I'd be interested to sort of find out if you think what I'm sort of saying is, is interesting, um, or if you think it's an interesting approach, or the or the right approach, or whether it resonates with what you're doing in your, you know, individ, individual individual countries. So, just as a, a, a very sort of quick bit of background about me. So I work for uh, Education Scotland, which is part of the Scottish Government. We're an executive agency of the Scottish Government. Um, and we're responsible for, for, for lots of things, but in particular, we're responsible for school improvement at a, at, a, at a local level or a regional level. We're responsible for school inspection, going out and you know looking at the accountability frameworks around schools. Um, and we're responsible for curriculum and curriculum de development. And I, I look after three bits of bits, bits of, the, of the org. So anything to do with curriculum and, and curriculum in, innovation. And I've got a small curriculum innovation team at the moment. I look after the work that we do around digital learning and teaching, which includes some of the boring stuff, in my opinion, around the internet to schools and the and the wires and the broadband and those sorts of things, but also some of the more innovative stuff that we've been able to do in COVID, um, such as what we call eSchool, so uh, electronic school in, in, in Gaelic, you know, where we provide uh, national, prov national provision during the periods of lockdown, but also at the moment that for children that are self-isolating as a result of, of Omicron. Um, because that's been a particular problem for us, particularly in our very, very small rural schools, where you might have one teacher and perhaps three or four students. And of course, if that teacher goes off, it's very, very difficult to find replacements, particularly on our, in our island communities in Scotland. Um, and I also look after um, our professional learning and leadership programmes, which includes um, something which I'll call systems leadership, which is part of what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, um, but also the, the, the training programmes that our head teachers and the school leaders uh, have to go through and they get supported for government to be able to, to do to do that as well. But I'm mainly going to be focusing on the work of the curriculum innovation team because they've been uh, working a lot around our sort of current reform agenda. And I need to tell give you a bit of background first to kind of understand what, 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 what we're doing. Otherwise, I think it might appear like a little bit out of context. So if you forgive me or, or just humor me for the sort of first five minutes, hopefully the background will be useful and hopefully, therefore, we'll get a bit more out of the discussion. So I thought we'd maybe um, start with this slide here, uh, which is pretty much how I summarise the last two years of my life. Um, before COVID, a lot of kind of fuzziness in the middle uh, and now around that. I uh, don't know about you, but in the height of the pandemic, I struggled to remember what I was doing yesterday, let alone last week, let alone six months ago. And actually, that's pretty tricky for policy making because you forget your instant memory you know, around that because we're operating in stressful times, a time really of toxic stress when you've got big responsibilities such as looking after children and young people you know or, fund, or funding schools but the thing that I've been reflecting on most commonly is that every time we had an outbreak of covid or a or a national lockdown or a or a change of regulations with young people having to wear masks in schools or not or changes of ventilation we often found ways to get around that so in every kind of outbreak of covid that we've had which are hopefully starting to get a little bit less severe. We also, if you like, had these kind of little pockets of innovation around that. So I started to do a lot of thinking with my small curriculum innovation team. Uh, and we started to think about like innovation and what we learned from COVID and actually sort of you know, trying to actually sort of challenge, well, how can we do things differently you know, as we move forward? And there's a lot of talk about that. But the things that I notice in schools, both in Scotland and the rest of the UK and in other countries, is that people are very, very keen to get back to old ways of working which weren't necessarily the best ways of working. It's just what they remember. Uh, and it gives them a, you know, it gives them a sense, a, a sense of comfort to kind of get back there. And a good example of this, I think, is that around um, when we talk about innovation and digital learning, 
And everybody I speak to when I say the words, what, what was one of the most innovative things coming out of COVID when we think about the schools? People go, oh, it's digital learning, like kids learning online. And I say, well, that's maybe true, but I really want to challenge that, you know, a little bit, because I'm not saying that actually that wasn't important or teachers got upskilled or kids were able to learn, you know, in a different way. But actually, I kind of think that in terms of innovation during COVID, what we saw in some of our communities was really a map around innovation to do with people collaborating more, innovation in terms of communities coming together, you know, health working a lot better with education than we'd seen previously before, working with school transport networks to do before. And we kind of got rid of all of that bureaucracy to actually try and really create really, really strong partnership. And what else did we do? We also worked at a really high pace of change. It happened and we took reaction straight away. We didn't get tied down in the paperwork and the bureaucracy of that, but we actually delivered okay services for children and young people, bearing in mind that we didn't know what we were, you know, what, what we were doing. So I think the real innovations during COVID, you know, are around some of these things as well. So we started to think to ourselves, we've got this period of reform that's coming up in Scottish education. How can we think about collaboration, community, partnership, pace of change to try and do things that we need to do now so that when the actual reform comes, it doesn't feel like we're always chasing our tail and trying to get on with things. What can we do now to prepare for us, to, to prepare the ground as I gave the present result? Now, to help understand this a little bit more, uh, we need to just understand a little bit about the Scottish curriculum, which I'll kind of explain now. So as, as, I, would, as I would say, is that I think the curriculum in Scotland, in many ways, is really quite developed. I actually think it's really quite innovative, like in some, in some, ways, some ways as well. I would also say, despite the fact that we've been working on this for a long time, for a, for a long time um, and I've been working on it for the whole 20 years, either as a classroom teacher or as a school leader or as a policy maker or, do, or doing things, is that you know, we're, we're still to really realise the benefit and the impact in, in schools. And I think one of the key messages is, is that anything that we do takes a long time to get embedded. Uh, and I think we've learned lessons from that. But I just kind of want to give a bit of history here just to sort of ex explain this. So the current curriculum, which we call Scottish Curriculum, Curriculum for Excellence, it's sometimes called, it came around around a debate for education in 2002, so 20 years ago. Um, it established a curriculum review group. Um, the first documentation, the first of many, many documents, far too many documents that we produced over the last 20 years was produced in 2000 and 2004. And it identified the four key purposes of education in Scotland for young people to become successful learners confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors. And you'll notice that that's in 2004 and there's no measure of math standards or numeracy standards or knowledge or, 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 or any of these things. Now these are embedded in the curriculum and we'll talk about this in a minute, but at the time it was really quite, quite radical in terms of what it did. The curriculum within schools started to be introduced in 2010. It took a number of years to be introduced because it was a phased introduction particularly, you know, particularly in, sec in secondary schools, and that takes us up all the way to the kind of present day. Now, if you work in policy, you'll think to yourself, well, hang on a minute, if it was introduced in 2010, curriculum tends to get reviewed every sort of 10 years, it goes round in circles, so we're due, if you like, for another sort of review coming up, and more about that in a second. But I suppose the interesting thing from those documents in 2004 was really kind of setting out the stall of what we meant by the curriculum. So again, in this very, very early terminology here, which is still used in the present day, we haven't changed our core message, is that the whole point of the curriculum is for young people to gain the knowledge, skills and attributes for life in the 21st century. So we're talking about skills a lot this morning. That's you know embedded in policy you know, right from the start. The other important thing, I guess, that you know is that when we think about the Scottish curriculum, we think about it from the ages of three to the ages of 18. It spans primary school into secondary school. A young person finishes primary school at about the age of 11 and they go into secondary school and a broad general education or young people are expected to take a broader general education from primary school into secondary school until they enter what we call the senior phase and a young person would enter the senior phase at around 14 or 15 and that's when they go into the kind of examination sort of cycle you know in the assessment cycle which is common in many in many countries. Interestingly, in Scotland, young people have the opportunity to take part in a portfolio of qualifications um, at, when, at the age of 15, uh, sorry, at the age of 16, 17 and 18, and they're assessed each year. And it's about stage, not age. So you might get some young people that take bits of qualification at 18 and some other young people might take those bits of qualification at 
six uh, at, at, at 16 and and somewhere in between there's no leaving certificate as such it's made up a portfolio of bits and you put these portfolio of bits together to try and get something which is a bit more bespoke for the young person so just thinking a little bit about you know what i've said there in terms of in terms of the curriculum and, and, where, and, where, and where we are it's important to think about some of the frameworks that we put in place you know ar ar around this again a lot of this is you know quite old in many ways it's over a, over a decade old and the first bit is a little bit about you know what we believe the vehicles that we use for for for, for doing this and that's the curriculum i'll explain a bit more about that in a moment and the bit about how we get there which is the bit that we're always sort of trying to tweak with so i've mentioned the kind of the four capacities already so these are the four capacities that we're trying to aim towards that we want young people to be successful learners confident individuals responsible citizens and effect and effective con con contributors and our vehicle you know to help kind of achieve this is the curriculum now this is the important bit because we take a different view on the curriculum in scotland to many countries of the world so in many countries around the world the curriculum is around curriculum areas and subjects but in scotland we define the curriculum as the totality you know of the planned experiences for children and young people throughout the educate their education and that's important and when i was working on this particular diagram with my team we purposely put curriculum areas and subject in the bottom right hand corner because that's the bit that quite often people focus on and they forget about the totality of the curriculum so a young person that's participating in a curriculum in, in, in scotland would also have opportunities for personal achievement this might include extracurricular activities or activities that are done in lunch, lunchtime. It might include extraction from normal core classes to actually get that, that, that part of it, and they would be you know, rewarded and that would be recognized through a portfolio. It includes opportunities for interdisciplinary learning, remembering, of course, that in order to have good interdisciplinary learning, you need to have good disciplinary learning first. Otherwise, actually, it becomes tokenistic at best when, it, when it's done, so working on that. And then also around the ethos and the life of the school community. So being proud of the school, participating in the school community, leadership responsibility for students. And this is all part of the totality of the Scottish curriculum, which contributes towards those four capacities that I was talking about. And people will say, well, that's all very well, but how do we do that? And we say, well, this is around actually the principles of curriculum design or the principles of curriculum making is what we sometimes, sometimes call it. So how do we work with schools because the the, the curriculum there's, there's a lot of agency in scottish schools so that they can make the curriculum which is appropriate for their young people in their classrooms in their schools in their communities in their regions in scotland and of course being part of that global curriculum as well so it's important we think that teachers know the big ideas subject matter and skills we won't touch on that too much today um understanding um their own support needs for their own professional development a massive ex a massive emphasis on professional learning networks for teachers to learn from each other around that to share practice not you know, having this information parachuted from above but sharing and experimenting with practice a huge focus on collaborative inquiry like research engaged schools we've been doing that now for about 10 for 10 years being real on, really clear on the practical examples of pedagogies around that and that's something we need to get better at we're really strong on that in the early years we're really strong on that in the senior phase it's the bit in between that we need to get better at. I'm just being very honest about that. And then the whole idea then about understanding the learners, you know, obviously including learners that have got um, additional support needs as described in some in some countries. So as I say, we've been working on this curriculum now, you know, for, for, for a period for a period of time. It was introduced in 2010 and we had the first kind of review of the curriculum in 2015 by the OECD as part of one of the one of the cycles you know, where they made some comments, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the curriculum. Um, many of these comments positive and as you would imagine also some areas you know for improvement particularly in the area of how can you get more schools to work together in a collaborative way you know, rather than in a way of competition so one of the big policy changes that we made back in 2015 is that we took the 32 areas of scotland the 32 regional governments who have got responsibility you know for education in each of the regions and even though these 32 areas still exist from a local government point of view we put them together in groups around improvement collaboratives. And this meant, for example, if you worked in one of the islands, which has got a small population, it mean, meant that you could hook into and you were accountable to work with some of the other areas in Scotland around that kind of improvement agenda around, around that. And we allocated nationally budget and resource to support these improvement collaboratives so they could work on aspects of professional learning and curriculum making you know, with, with teachers. That was back in 2015. And then in 2021, delayed slightly because of the pandemic, 
we asked the OECD to come back again, you know, to give us a view of the curriculum, you know, and, and where we were, and then to take us to the next steps. And again, there's lots of broadly positive things, both in the report about assessment uh, and in the report, but also there were 12 recommendations. Now, I'm not going to go over the recommendations, you know, in, in detail. We haven't got time for to do that today. I just kind of really wanted to demonstrate that there were 12 things to do. And really what these recommendations say in part is that we're working towards a period of reform where we're going back to sort of think about the knowledge you know, and the skills and the attributes of in the curriculum again. And that's really the kind of point of the presentation today is they're at this kind of stage now. And then at some point, we're going to be moving into reform again, like a big reform project you know, in, in, in Scotland, building on what we've already done. And to put that into context, you know, a little bit, a little bit more, as you would expect with, you know, with any sort of democratic sort of society, um, there's been there's a consultation process which has gone out led by Professor Muir of the University of the West of Scotland around education reform, and he was commissioned. So this the, the OECD report was published in in July. He was commissioned in September to go out and to, to, to do almost like a state of the nation report. You know, around, around, you know, around, around the system, and as I mentioned before, he's due to report back next week. So, the consultation was launched in September. Um, his findings will be published in, uh, you know, in, in in February, and we've got this kind of new school year here. Now, the point, I guess, of the presentation about the sowing the seeds is that within our curriculum innovation team, which is a small team within Education Scotland, we're thinking to ourselves, well, something's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen around that, but there's going to be some kind of recommendations that are going to be made. So what do we know now that we think that will be in this report? report and what can we do now in this pre-reform stage, this exploratory phase, so that once we get the report findings and once we move into that, we're kind of ready to go. And that we've tested some of the ideas, you know, and different bits that maybe we've not been so successful in the past, in, in the past so that as we start to go into this period of reform, which will take a number of years, as all reforms do, that we're kind of ready for that, you know, and we're a bit more prepared for that. And one of the reasons that, of course, we were thought to do about that is that um, what I've learned over the years is it's really, really easy to reform the wrong things. Um, and in fact, we're really, really good at that in governments, you know, and, and, and in places. And what we're particularly good at um, is we're particularly good at um, starting curriculums again, you know, right from the start, sort of saying, actually, do you know what, nothing's worked. Let's just start again from scratch with a blank piece of paper and decide what we want the curriculum to be and, and all that and kind of ignore like all of that, all of that kind of good stuff. So we've sort of thinking a bit about from our team is again, well, actually, do you know what? Starting again is easy, um, but it's not always the right things to do, which kind of comes back to my sort of original sort of title slide there is that actually there are lots of good things about Scottish education. We've got some really, really strong roots in terms of what we've done. So how do we make sure that we keep these roots strong, even if actually what we're gonna be delivering in schools might look a little bit different in five or six years? because it tends to be the surface level stuff which is tackled by reform, not the deep roots you know, of the problem. So we thought a little bit more about this and we thought, right, well, actually, if we've got this kind of period of time, what's one of the main things that we can do? What do we know is definitely gonna happen? Well, we definitely know there's gonna be some sort of change. And then we asked ourselves the question, well, actually, do you know what? How good are we really as a government, as a system at helping teachers prepare for change and leading change and managing change and absorbing change and coping with change at a time when they're completely exhausted because of the pandemic and we're about to say we're going to change the curriculum and the answer of course is that we're not very good at preparing teachers for that um, around that because quite often we just say there's going to be change and you've got this amount of time to change but we don't give people the tools to help you know with the change you know as, as part as part of that so as part of what we've um we've done around around this within our professional learning programs is that you know we've brought together sort of change elements within all of the programs that we've got so we have programs for initial teacher training we have programs for initial leadership we have programs that i mentioned for the training of head teachers and this new program that we brought in which is called leading systems change where we where we bring together those people that we learned that worked really really well together from the, from the pandemic from health from education from policy and the transport to think about change within its widest context to share these ideas to take this forward it's a big supported national uh, program which is based on evidence but it's really about getting all the people at the moment in the virtual room to talk through some of these ideas and what these solutions might be because of course the most important thing about change and this is a really simple thing to say is it's just knowing the people that you're going to be in the room with when that change happens because actually managing change is all about managing relationships and if you've not got the relationships it's difficult to manage the change you come up to these kind of conflict points 
so this work around sort of change and then we also thought well what else do we maybe need to sort of do around some of these things so we decided on these short work streams short life work streams that are being led out of the curriculum innovation team around these these aren't large hugely funded government programs this is kind of all stuff that's happening because of course one of the things that we're trying to do at the moment is not put additional pressure on the system when teachers and head teachers are incredibly tired so one of the things that comes through really really strongly in the oecd review um, as it comes through with a lot of modern education systems is the the importance of co-creating you know a curriculum you know with teachers you know and with with school leaders so we thought to ourselves well actually you know how good are we at co-creation like at, at the moment and we've, we've had some success within that in the past right but we're not actually necessarily at the moment bringing tools like design thinking or service design you know into our teacher training programs we're not necessarily giving people the tools to think a little bit differently about how they might co-create and reinvent the curriculum so we thought right well let's experiment with some of these ideas to see if we can get a bit better at that so that when we go into that period of reform we've got some ideas about how we might co-create curriculum better and we've tested these ideas in advance so that's in essence co-create some of these ideas in advance of the reform to make sure that we're upskilled so we asked a few people what's the bits that you struggle with at the moment you know in terms of the scottish curriculum and it was around well interdisciplinary learning we're still struggling with that a little bit we're still struggling with this idea of learner pathways like how do we pull this together so we produced these two thought papers with them and these aren't glossy government documents they're purposely not glossy government documents because nobody likes glossy government documents these are documents that were co-created with at least one person from those 32 different areas that i talked across scotland and key people from those other groups as well you know who went through those principles of service design to try and say as a group of people from across scotland this is what we think a good learner pathway looks like and this is what we think a good interdisciplinary learning path looks like and of course the important thing about that is it means that the regions own it like rather than it being owned by this national sort of top-down model around that and that in itself you know is quite empowering and we thought well now we've kind of got a view you know around how this worked and we, we learned a lot from that now we've got a view around like learner pathways and, and interdisciplinary learning we probably need some good examples you know about how these put a, a put their a put there in practice so again with the learner pathways one for example we thought well let's reach out and rather than producing these big glossy case studies you know of seen what to be, be working let's just sort of see if we can get some schools that seem to be doing some pretty good stuff all right and let's see if we can kind of get them online as a series of what we call routes to success uh, web webinars and let's see whether they'll just come and present in a kind of ted format for about 10 minutes quickly showing people where they've improved these learner pathways and if people are interested in that then get in contact with the school you know and they can they can they can expand there and we ran uh, about six of these different sort of models these sort of online online seminars a very very different format than we than we normally normally had before and out of the um the secondary schools in scotland and there aren't many secondary schools in scotland there's about 360 we had nearly 200 secondary schools opting to come along to these things voluntary after school and it just kind of magnituded over, over time to sort of share this practice so again different approach to what we to what we had had before and we're now in the process of going back to the four capacities that i've already mentioned and thinking about again using the people from across across scotland to think about what do we mean by the four capacities are they still relevant let's try and get ourselves into a strong position before we enter you know into that reform time and then we thought to ourselves well actually do you know what these tools to do with service design they're pretty good they've been well received let's tweak them slightly and let's turn them into a curriculum design toolkit so if you're starting to think a little bit about um you know how you might implement curriculum within your own school within your own local co local context let's give a few tools that you might want to use as a senior leader to kind of help you do that to help you set the, on your journey and again importantly with all of this work we've not pushed this out aggressively in any way partly because the system is currently overloaded but we're just putting this out for people that have got the capacity to use it and we're getting feedback and then eventually when we get into the period of reform you know we will refine these tools so probably for the first time we're publishing tools that aren't quite finished and we're trying to be brave about that right rather than waiting until they are finished and then those tools going out too late so again we're using the system to test on these you know a little a little a little bit more we've also really been thinking about that term curriculum making and thinking about how can we support that in each of the regions so again as part of this pre-reform work we've set up what we call curriculum design networks 
in each of these different er different different areas. COVID's helped us with that because all these are, these these are online now. You know, but opportunities for groups of schools that want to, it's all opt in at the moment because we're pre-reform, to come together to understand the curriculum and to talk about making of the curriculum. And again, that comes back to what I was saying about the root of the problem. If the people don't understand the current curriculum and what's possible with the current curriculum, then quite often you just reform the wrong things. So there's a lot of talk for the moment about reforming assessment in Scotland, but some of what's talked about you know, is actually things that already exist and that already are quite strong. It's just that they're not embedded in schools. So the difference between, you know, making sure that things are actually embedded and then moving from there, you know, rather than starting again. And one of the other projects that we're working on, this is sort of linked to co-design as well, <coughs> is, and this is important for reform, there's a huge project around, you know, around language. Uh, and this is the only time that I'll, that I'll quote from the, from the OECD report, but but language was mentioned a lot, you know, and as I read through the report, it's a long report, it's 140 pages or something like that, but language was mentioned a number of times about how within the Scottish system, when we're talking about certain terms like skills or knowledge or attitudes or attributes or capacities or competencies or disposition, you know, a teacher in the classroom next door might have a different definition. The teacher and the head teacher might have a different definition. A teacher in a different part of Scotland might have a different definition. Now, if you're going to reform the curriculum, Unless you're all speaking speaking the same language, you might be reforming different things at the at the same time, or, or reforming some things to meet the same thing. So it sounds like a really simple idea, but just this idea of how do we make sure that we get this common language. And I was, you know, thinking about this a little bit more, and we've been doing a lot of work with the team on this. And I've also been reminiscing a lot about when things when travel was possible. Uh, and these are some pictures here that I took in 2018 in Montana, the USA, um, which says entering Glasgow which is a city in Scotland, Inverness, which is a city in the north of Scotland as well, Dunkirk, right, which is a city in France, uh, and Devon, a city in the southeast of England. And it made me sort of think to myself about the importance of language, because of course, if I was in Montana and I was talking about Glasgow, and I was talking about Glasgow, Scotland, and they were talking about Glasgow, Montana, very, very different, we could think for a period of time we're talking about the same thing, yet culturally, it's very, very different. So this language bit, you know, is important, you know, and I also, interestingly enough, you know, when we were looking at this and we were searching into this a little bit more, you know, it was, in, it was interesting that Inuit populations have got 78 words for snow, you know, and the Hawaiians have got 65 different words for describing fishing nets um, and uh, all, all sorts of different definitions. And of course, you, you, you expect that in some ways, because as you become an expert in something, so imagine if you lived in Hawaii, you might not be an expert in snow, but if you lived in Arctic Canada, you might be, which means you need to describe it better around that. So we started to have these kind of interesting discussions around, well, what's the basic language of Scottish education that everybody needs to know to speak the same language to inform the reform? What's the legal language that people need to know? And actually, as you become a specialist, what, how do you get further depth to that language around additional support needs and other things? And that's important to you, but it's that core language that we need to get important as we move into that. So again, very, very focused on co-creation as part, as part of this. Again, we already use this in our professional learning programs. A big fan of what we call the three fields of knowledge, where we take public knowledge, of normally from academic research or from evidence, and teachers say, well, that's no use to me in my classroom, that's far too academic. So, but you take that kind of public knowledge and that evidence base, and you can combine that with practical knowledge, actually what's delivered in the classroom, and you bring these things together to sort of try and create this new knowledge. And that becomes the language of the curriculum and the language of Scotland and sort of move, moving forward with it. And then linking all these things together, you know, applying these very, very basic models to it. So if we can define it, you know, with the language, if we can exemplify it through practical examples, which are self-selected by schools and peer reviewed, that's important. And then if we can give people those empowerment tools around service design to take those examples, and then to turn them for their own local context, we start to get like a really kind of interesting, I think, sort of pre-reform model around that. And all of the time, when we're looking at these things, of course, we're starting to think around, right, well, curriculum, assessment and pedagogy. Let's make sure that these aren't individual. Let's make sure that these are kind of intertwined, you know, and pulled together, like all of the time. So if I'm trying to teach a certain type of knowledge, what are the best pedagogies, you know, for, 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 you know, for, 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 doing, for, doing, for doing that? If I'm trying to assess something, and the young people has been taught how to do it in the best way. Why am I assessing it with a written paper 
when actually it's a practical subject around, around that. So how are we intertwining all of these things going forward? And interestingly enough, in Scotland, we're not bad at that, like in the early years, like in the early years of school around that and how we do that and how we document and, uh, and how we sort of record young people's learning. But we're not particularly good at that in the senior phase, which becomes very, very exam focused. So again, just starting to use with our curriculum design networks, things like the innovative pedagogies reports from the Open University, you know, which looks at different types of pedagogies, new pedagogies with and without technology, and just sort of trying to challenge people a little bit more about what do we mean by these things. And then thinking to people and asking the curriculum design networks around, well, you know, we've got these skills in Scotland, we've got these skill frameworks. So what's the pedagogy to teach feeling or creativity or sense making? There's no answer to that, you know, as such, but these are kind of really, really good provocations to get people into a kind of interesting thinking space. And again, the last sort of part really is challenging these curriculum design networks in this pre-reform period is that as we move into this new curriculum, what are the big ideas that young people in Scotland would be expected to know and how do we integrate them into the curriculum? You know, and it only takes a, a look through the BBC News website over a number of months and you start to see these kind of referring, the recurring themes of, you know, things like qualities, things like climate crisis, post-COVID, democratic deficit, empowered youth, democratic, democratic change, economy, labour market conundrums. What are these kind of big ideas, these big societal things that are affecting Scotland around that? And how are we going to take these big ideas and help young people understand these big ideas or give them the skills to cope with some of these big ideas and challenges you know, moving forward? We haven't got the answers to that yet, but that's what we're doing with these kind of curriculum design networks. And I guess one of the things that we use in schools a lot is this concept of when a school is reviewed, we encourage them to be reflective, to look inwards, to look outwards to other schools, to think about that, but to always look forwards. And what we've tried to do with this piece of work is we've tried to improve this very, very simple self-evaluation framework that we use in schools and in classrooms a lot within our own sort of national team. Okay, so let's look inwards, first of all. Let's be reflective. Are we actually delivering what we need to deliver? Let's look outwards and get support from other people. And then how do we keep that kind of forward focused lens as well? And all the time, you know, this is happening with the profession, but it's not a big splash in terms of what we're doing there because we know as well that the profession at the moment is completely tired, it's exhausted. But what we're trying to do is to try and give a bit of space and provide a bit of a resource so that when we get into that period of reform, we're not adding we're not adding additional pressure. There'll always be additional pressure for resource going forward because of course, everything's happening here uh, in the time of COVID, when money's tight, when resources are tight, when people are stressed, when people don't have the energy and those sorts of things. So that's a kind of uh, introduction. I've probably talked far too much long in there, but hopefully it was interesting around uh, what, it, what, it, what, it was, what I was sort of saying and what we're trying to do in terms of this sort of pre-reform period, which is a, a different thing to kind of reform ar around that. Um, I'll just uh, stop, stop sharing my, my screen now, and then we'll maybe just um, open up to questions and dialogue, if that's okay. I have a question. Sure, Catherine, um, yeah. <laughs> thanks for that, Ollie. It was really, really interesting and really um, just the kind of depth of thinking about thinking and, and how you're doing it is really, really interesting to see. My question, probably a bit of an awkward one, <laughs> like where is the impetus for change coming from? Like throughout the presentation, there was lots of moments where you were talking about kind of exhausted teachers, about there being a lot going on, about, you know, this sort of almost change fatigue, but then a kind of inevitability of change. But, and, and this is me like a bit of a provocation, but like, is there not a really strong, you know, this is kind of the opposite to a lot of, you know, a lot of, governments where you're like you need to do more like is there yeah. an impetus to to actually let's just have steady state for a little bit longer like let's just ride the pandemic a little bit longer let's you know because it doesn't feel like you know anything is like a burning platform of like you know it, it, whereas in other jurisdictions it may be like there's some real huge challenges whereas it it feels like kind of it, you're in that kind of great to excellent 
phase of, of development. So I'm just trying to understand, like, you know, and the answer may just be it's intrinsic motivation and we're all, you know, but I'm just trying to understand a bit more of like, where is that in a system like yours, where does the impetus for ongoing reform come from? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> it's good. It's, 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 it's a brilliant question. You know, it's a, it's a brilliant question. And I, and I see that, that Neil's got his hand up as well. He, he might want to come in and give a different perspective. And uh, if you weren't in the call before, Neil, Neil and I are sat about 50 miles from each other. But if I was to drive to Neil's house, it would probably take me a couple of hours because we've got a big mountain range like in, 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 in between us. I didn't, I didn't realise that Neil was going to be on the call this morning. So it's great to have him here as well with, with, with his expertise. So I think the impetus for change comes from comes from a, num from a number of things. One of them is government pressure. So I'm not saying if any of these things are right or wrong, but one, one, of, the, one, of, one of these is government, government pressure and, and opposing views you know, of, of government. That's compounded at the moment, I guess, within Scotland, because we're into the first year of a, of a, of a new cycle of government, same administration-ish, <laughs> but, but the first year of that, which means if you're gonna put changes through within a reform, you've got that kind of five-year cycle to do that. So you, so you, so you really need to sort of start in that year, in that, in that, in that, in that year one. There's obviously political pressure in the chamber to kind of do that as well. Um, the second, the second one, you know, I think is really around um, COVID, like I have, like I have to say, um, and and there's a, a real wicked problem here in terms of that people are changed and there is sort of that change, 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 change fatigue, but there has, I think, been a a real, a real recognition um, of some of the benefits. Um, for for learning and teaching, you know, and 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 digital that have come out that have come out for that, and actually, if we want to sort of change the way that the schools have worked worked structurally, like during dur dur during that time, at a time of in a, in a non in a non COVID world, you would need to make some changes to the system, you know, around, around that. Th th there's there's also, and again, it'd be super to get sort of Neil's Neil's opinion on this, but there, there's there's also I, I think been a been a, a long standing feeling within the profession. That we've kind of got the broad general education right, or, or, or like, like around that, and it can always be improved. But that senior phase when it comes to exams, it's basically been a reinvention of what we've had previously around that, but we've got more choice. And the problem that you get, of course, is that if you still have that kind of focus in the senior phase, then, then actually that starts to go down to the broad general education. So rather than it being broad, it actually becomes a mini version of the senior phase, of this, this, the senior phase going up. So going back and revisiting those kind of pedagogical aspects of that, you know, I think, um, you know, I think are, are, you know, are very, are very, very, very important. And the, um, the, the fourth one, which I guess is sort of mixed in with, with, with all of this, is that within Scotland, and indeed within any country of, of the world, it, it is that there's still large regional variation. Now, now you could argue that there's variation between this classroom and that classroom, and there and there often is, you know, around around that as well. But when we look at performance around that, and we could debate around how we measure the performance in different in different ways, when we look at the performance within those local authorities, there are there are definitely some where it would appear that the kids are getting a better deal in some and not in others. So how do we level that up in terms of that kind of equity equity agenda? And obviously, the curriculum reform is seen to as a vehicle for doing that. It's not necessarily the right vehicle. But again, going back to that political point is, is part of it. Neil, Neil, did you want to come in and, and ask a question or just comment on that as well with your experience? Yeah, yes, I would very much. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah. What I want to say is this has been going on for much, much longer than is given prominence in Scotland with this 2004 reform of four capacities and seven principles design. I was a head teacher then. I thought it was completely inspirational. I'm just going to put something in the chat from that period. I am, I really take the point of Catherine's point. I'm getting a little bit, I'm sort of getting to be reform weary. What I would like to see is permeation of ideas. Because one mm -hmm. of my frustrations is that we had a curriculum agency before Education Scotland, because it got merged with the inspectorate called Learning and Teaching Scotland. And there was a national one in the UK called BECTA, British Education and Communication Teaching Association. We did a huge amount of work with them and were case studies in Plotton. And yet this, it all got flattened by the performativity agenda. It's been so performance orientated in terms of very narrow national um, literacy and numeracy. And in fact, that became the emphasis of the Scottish government right into 2016 with the Scottish Attainment Challenge and things. So what I, my plea is, we, for instance, did so much in actually making it work. And it's how it works in different school contexts. 
And I think I've been doing a huge amount now internationally. I mean, massively, 23 presentations in a number of years in every, in every continent in the world, looking at this interface about how it actually really works in different sport contexts. That's all I'll say for now, because I've got a real plea on that, because I feel that then different mindsets come in from a central agency, particularly the audit side of Education Scotland, and flatten and almost wipe out some very subtle curriculum changes that have got different conceptual underpinnings. I've written a huge amount on this. So that's my little observation. Thank you. And actually sort of, well, Neil's made lots of, lots of good points there, but one of, the, one of the known knowns about the new period of reform is that we'll be removing that inspection function, you know, from edu 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 Education Scotland to sort of keep that separate, you know, as, as well. And there, there, are, there, are, there are reasons for that. But one of, one, of, one of the most important reasons, I think, and I'm putting a bit of personal opinion on this, um, is, it, is, it, is, it might, is it might allow what's left of that agency to be more innovative, like in terms of what it's doing and test, and test ideas and to support schools in, in that, which is, which, is, which is what we had before, <laughs> to a certain extent. Can I just add one point on that? Because I actually really fundamentally disagree, and I was on a ministerial working group on this 11 years ago, what I want to see, and, and it's what I've been doing some stuff with in Ontario and Singapore, is building knowledge. I don't want inspection to be separate. I want it to completely change as a form of integral organic knowledge construction. And I feel that in Scotland, we're nowhere near close to that. And yet some other countries like Ontario and Singapore are. And it's such a fundamental shift. It almost requires your brain to work in a different way. Yeah. And, and I really want to put that in there because this is such an international forum. And there's some places where this is really happening. Thank you. Great, thanks, Neil. Any other questions, observations? Others there as well. I really like Mercy's comment we heard earlier, which was, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thanks. I saw that and I was about to respond to say yes uh, about it and then we got back into the main room. Uh, but it was around the idea that um, having worked with organizations and artists and raising their profiles and working with institutions and all that, we know that the arts is really important and, you know, we have to uh, kind of sort of influence each other and um, I, I think that the point of intervention is almost too late every time we think that the arts can can help to uh, with with reform, you know, and uh, that's what I I kind of said because you know they come to us and say, well, we need an artist to come in to go into the prisons, or we need uh, somebody to come and work with the schools. Because I work with the arts council with creative partnerships and whole school change, but. Mm -hmm it almost comes in too late and I'm thinking that it has to be around you know starting it from way back and kind of drip feeding whatever needs to be yeah that's 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 what I thought I think that's just brilliant absolutely brilliant thank you <clears throat> I, I, I think the um I think I think I think the arts and, and expressive arts if we allow me to sort of group them like that just just for now have, have been some of the most impacted, you know, by by, by COVID for a for a whole for a whole variety, you know, of of, of, re, of reasons. And I have a and I have a real worry that as we go into this sort of period, as we come out come out come out of COVID, that that focus on literacy and numeracy by so by so by so many by so many systems will will compound that even 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 more. Um, and I think that and I think there's an additional kind of worry in there, you know, because that, in, in times of austerity. You know, when you're trying to support young people in kind of creative activities, again, there could be sort of further squeeze on that. And I really think that's something we've got to watch like hu hugely around it. Could I, could I add a bit, come a bit here? I live in a very rural context in, in the Rockauch Plockton, very rural, but also we had huge amounts of children with additional support needs. And I really want to look back to that period. I know this is international, but the period of Scotland reform sort of 2004 to 89, because it was so creative. Mm -hmm. was turning the curriculum away from a fixed product model that's Passy Solberg's term but it just couldn't get any handle into the main agencies in Scotland and it frustrates me we're going to go into a new period of reform but yeah. what I wanted to do is to revisit 
what scores did, Clockton being one, but I can tell you others, where we were doing something so profound and powerful. In fact, I've actually put one of the years of our website into the chat. And I want that opened up. So what I want to do is open up some of what already exists, but with new conceptual tools, like knowledge building of Marlene Skadamalia, some of the stuff going on in Singapore with knowledge building, which I've co-presented. But what frustrates me is it's still so top down in Scotland. Mm -hmm. really, really top down so that I find it almost impossible to get a voice and even find myself presenting with agencies in other parts of the world and yet sort of excluded from the Scottish forums so that's the point I want to put to you Ollie yeah no it's a good you know it's a it, it, it's a it's a good it's a good point Neil I've, I've, been, I've been there myself hence rejoining government <laughs> To get that, to get that voice in the, uh, to get that voice in the door. <laughs> well, I did apply and get interviewed actually, but I didn't get the job. <laughs> Your job, but a similar one. Did get an interview. Yeah. But I think, but I think you know, I think one of the things that we're like genuinely sort of trying to do with curriculum innovation is is to give more sort of voice to the teachers, or, which is why we're doing, which is why we've we're do, doing this kind of work around co-creation and sharing and making all of that, you know, making all all of that, all of all of all of all of that work and. Um, and like, I'm super happy to involve you in that, Neil. Like we can, we can. That, that's that's. That we've got a, we've got a big piece of work that's um that's going to be coming up around kind of sort of knowledge, knowledge and skills, and really trying to un really trying to understand that you know a, a little bit more. And um, you know, again, and you know, just being very very honest is that being sort of quite challenging, you know, towards our sort of curricular teams in in terms of actually really understanding what goes out on what's going on in the ground and where the and where the good practices and where the interesting practices, you know, and how and how and how does that work? Um, can I say that some of the interesting stuff isn't what you might call conventionally excellent or conventionally good. I found the real breakthroughs becoming like fantastic when I had a child who was so disturbed and I found it's because his brother was serving in Afghanistan. Uh -huh. And he started yeah. to switch to sort of develop work when he did fantastic IT work or when I was working with software companies. But I'm afraid it did not fit with what we have. I don't know whether the rest of the world has local authority quality improvement and quality assurance. Uh -huh. Not did not fit that, not at all. I mean, not, yeah. nor does it fit the inspection agency, how good is the school framework? It just didn't fit it, not at all. Mm -hmm. not at all. Yeah. I've written on that. So, I mean, yeah. there, there does have to be engagement on that, really hard engagement on those issues. Yeah, I agree, completely agree, yeah. Right, I, I am gonna have to jump to my 9.30 meeting, which I'm now late for. <laughs> Great, lovely. <laughs> Good to but meet good to, um, good, to, good to good to connect. Yeah, lovely to see lovely to see everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Mercy. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mercy. Karina, we'll see you this afternoon. Yes, I will see you this afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I suggest um you hop over to the rest of Shalandra's um presentation. And yes, thank you, Ollie, um, for um the case study. Okay, thanks, folks. See ya. Thank you. Bye.